start with today's lecture. So in today's lecture, what we are doing is we've, so, so, so far, we've sort of gone through the process of going through all of the steps and we now have arrived at the last step. And this is what today's lecture is all about. So uh, we're going to finish up that last step today. And then in tomorrow's lecture, we're just going to touch a little bit on presentation. And then we're going to do a comprehensive example with multiple uh, transactions, right? And so that's the one that I want you to print out and bring to tomorrow's lecture if it's uh, physical. But even if you got only coming to online, please also just print it out. It's, it's valuable to have um, so that I can switch between slides and you can still sort of read the question on your side. Um, so if you've got a second screen, maybe pop it up on a second screen or print it out. Okay, so like we are saying, we have basically completed most of the definitions. Um, we did that already uh, in the first couple of lectures. We will add a few definitions today, but nothing too hectic in terms of definitions. We also looked at the difference between uh, revenue and income. And remember, we said that the income is that big bucket and revenue is, is like an apple in the bucket. It's something within the bucket. Um, and then the majority of our work from basically the middle of lecture one till now has been based on this third uh, learning outcome, this third objective that we've been focusing on the, on the five-step model and trying to understand the, the, the requirements of the five-step model. And so that's what we're going to finish up today. And then tomorrow, we're briefly going to have a session after we do the example. After we do the class example, we're going to briefly have uh, a few slides on uh, presentation. Uh, in line with that, I've also uploaded a, um, what do you call that, a uh, model set of financial statements that is already on ClickUp. It's under lecture notes. You can go and download that um, and that will help you to understand what is related to the presentation side of this, of this um, topic. Okay. Um, remember, as I said many times before, we want to try and understand why we're doing things. So the discussion is critically important and the calculations will follow on and the presentations will follow on from that uh, discussion. Right? So we want to try and understand why and uh, why we're doing something specifically when it comes to the model. Okay. Now, let us do a quick recap of Tuesday's lecture. So in Tuesday's lecture, we did two steps. We did step three, we did step four. We look at step three first. So the, the idea behind step three, the principle behind step three, the thing that was pulling it all together was that we wanted to ensure that whatever transaction price we arrive at, it is an amount of value, right? So that's why we use that word consideration. We said it must be amount of value that accurately reflects what we expect to earn in this contract, right? So that was the principle behind what we were doing on, on in the first lecture on Tuesday. We're trying to come up with what we accurately expect, what is expected for us to gain from this contract, right? Uh, and what is that value? And so that's why we were talking about that word consideration, meaning like a, a, an amount of value, um, it's, 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 it's like money, it's like value, it's that sort of stuff. And so that's what we're talking about there. Then we, we looked at a few things, but these are the main things that we looked at. Um, we looked at first a variable consideration, right? And we said a variable consideration changes because of something in the environment, right? So, so it's not in the contract. Right? It's not something that happens in the contract. It's not something where we know definitely it's going to happen. So it's, there's, there's some uncertainty. That's the word we must use. There's uncertainty when it comes to when it comes to this item, right? So there's something that has uncertainty, and then we have uh, a situation with a um, variable consideration. Okay, now. When we did, when we looked at variable considerations, we said, you know, so how do we come up with the with the value? How do we? What is the correct value that we use? And we said we need to do two things to arrive at this correct value. The first is we need to estimate, right? Which is basically you come up with the best expected value, the best value that you think is going to arise from the contract. And then the second step is that we constrain that estimate. And remember, I said, uh, I gave you that example with, with your test marks and how everyone will overinflate it. And so we 
need to constrain it and hold it down and make it reasonable, right? So, so that's what that is. So we estimate first and then we constrain our estimate um, and then that is the amount that we use as our consideration. Um, we also then spoke about a non-cash uh, consideration, non-cash meaning um, there's no money involved, right? So it's an asset, it's a uh, right, it's a uh, decrease in the liability. So, so those are the, the non-cash items, right? So it's not cash and cash equivalents. It can be an asset or a decrease in the liability that we're talking about. And we said this thing that we receive needs to be measured uh, in the transaction price at its fair value, right? At its fair value. And then we said, if we can't use the fair value, we must try our hardest. If we can't use the fair value, and we can't find the fair value, then we can maybe go with standalone selling price, right? So those um, are the two main sort of topics that we did there. And linked to that was, and we revisited this topic because we did sort of touch on it in lecture one, is this idea of a contract or refund liability, right? So a liability that arises. We basically said that it's revenue, right? It's money, it's income that we've received, but we're not ready to recognize it uh, as, as revenue by definition. So it's income we've received, but it's not revenue. So we put it into this thing called uh, the refund liability until such time we know what to do with it, right? And that's when I said, you know, I hate a suspense account. And this is a type of like a, a, an account that needs to be eliminated. We need to get rid of the refund liability eventually, right? We said we can call it refund liability. We can call it contract liability. And it can also be called revenue received in advance. All of those will attract marks. All of those are equal and correct account names. Okay, so now let's quickly look at, at step four. So that was step three. Step four, we uh, have now determined the uh, POs, the performance obligations. We've determined the transaction price in step three. Now we need to allocate that transaction price to the individual performance obligations, right? We need to decide how much does each represent in the contract. And so we said the golden standard for us is to use the relative uh, standalone transaction, uh, the standalone selling prices of each of the performance obligations, right? And remember, we, we did that thing where we calculated that ratio and then we applied it to the transaction price to get what each PO, the amount of revenue each PO uh, can, can, can attract. And we said the, the, the best case situation is that we look at a market and we have an observable price, right? That's the best case situation. Uh, and that what is, that's what we should be using. But in the case that it doesn't happen, where we can get an observable price, we've got three methods that we can choose from. The first was market adjusted. And that's basically where we, we can't, cannot find it in our market. So we look at another market and we might need to adjust it for the specific situation of our entity. Um, we also can use the cost plus method, which is where we take the cost and we add a reasonable markup. And now remember, we didn't define reasonable markup then, but we're going to end up defining it in today's lecture. So we need to add that reasonable markup. Uh, and then the, the last one was that residual approach. And the residual approach only works when there's only one PO that does not have a standalone selling price, right? And there's only one PO where there's no selling price. And uh, therefore, then we use the residual method. We then said that this test about allocating the, the transaction price to the POs are go, is going to be done only at the beginning of the contract, right? We only need to do it once at the beginning of the contract. It's not like the other criteria that we need to keep reassessing. Um, and then finally, we said that if we have a discount, we must allocate it in the same way that we allocated the transaction price to as much as possible in the same way. And less specific criteria are met, then we can do it in a different method. And we said in our tests and exams, if that is the case, we will be told in the question that the specific criteria was met. And therefore, this is the, the method which we need to use to allocate the discount. Um, but we said, as the general rule of thumb, um, the discount is allocated in the same way that the transaction price is allocated. Okay. Um, 
Cool. So that was step one, uh, I mean, step three and four. Any questions on the summaries, you can just pop it in the chat. Uh, but remember, the summaries are not to learn from, right? They're not, they're not the, the, the source that you need to learn from. They are a tool that needs to be used in conjunction with your textbook and in conjunction with your homework and tutorial questions, right? They are a tool just to uh, refresh your memory. Now, remember our overlying principle, our, uh, the, the sort of the, the key principle in this section was that we want to record uh, revenue for the amounts that we actually expect to be entitled to, right? The amounts that we actually inspect, expect to, to, to receive. So that is what we want to record revenue as. And so the, the five-step model is trying to get us to that stage right and we said the key to getting to that stage is that we must record the economic substance over the legal form right remember we repeated that over and over again um so the economic substance over the legal form is what we want to aim for All right and so what we've done so far is we've identified that there's a contract. We I looked at the contract and found out how many promises are performance obligations, right? Remember, we said performance obligations are distinct promises, right? So now we've looked at it, we've identified the promises, and then we've gone and find, found what the performance obligations are. Uh, then we determined the price might be variable, might be non-cash, etc. We did that. Then we allocated the price. Now we ask ourselves, when do we record the journal entry when do we pass the journal entry so this is what step five is all about it's about when it's about timing right when do we pass the journal entry and so that's what we're going to spend today working on now the standard says that we must process that journal entry when there's a satisfaction of the obligation right so remember the obligation is a promise for goods and services it's an expectation on the part of the customer and we are told that we must record the revenue uh, when that expectation has been met, okay? The expectation for goods and services has been met, then we record the revenue. So the question then is, when will the expectation be met, right? And the standard says expectations are met when goods and services, the control of goods and services is in the customer's hands. Right? The control of goods and services is in the customer's hands. We're going to talk just now about what control means. Okay. But just keep in mind that the control of the goods and services need to be in the customer's hands for us to say that the performance obligation has been satisfied. Right. And only when the performance obligation is satisfied can we then journalize, can we pass our journal for, for the, the revenue. Okay. Now, there's two types or there's two methods in which uh, the performance obligations can be satisfied and there's two methods in which the, the the control can be obtained by the customer the first is it happens instantaneously right so at a point in time so at a point in time means instantaneously right and then we can say over time so the uh, other one is over time, meaning that it happens over a period of time. Time has to pass in order for the control to, to, to pass to the, to the customer. So there's two methods. The one is um, at a point in time, and then the other one is over, over time. Now, the standard only gives us criteria for one, right? The standard only gives us criteria for one of these methods of satisfaction. Right. And the standard only gives us criteria for overtime. And then it says that if the criteria for overtime, right, satisfaction uh, overtime is not met, then it must be at a point in time. Right. So basically, we have to do the test for uh, a satisfaction overtime. And if the test for satisfaction overtime is not met, then we're going to assume that it's um, at a point in time. Okay. Um, but now remember, the, the, the crux to all of this is that we, we want to identify when the control has passed, okay? We want to identify when the control has passed. Now, let's look in detail at control. When we're looking at control, I want you to start to think about the laptops that you use in the LAN, right? The laptops that we use in the LAN. So that's our example. Just think about that, and I'm sure many of you have used or seen people use the laptops in the in the computer land um, or the computer room, 
I don't know what you guys call it these days. But um, so, so um, I want you to think about that and we're going to apply the definition of control to the use of those laptops or computers in the computer land and see if you control it. Right. So there's a question in the chat, which I will deal with now. It says, can we regard overtime um, to a bond for a house, uh, meaning that the customer owns the house after they have paid up the bond? So the answer is no. So despite what you think with a bond in a house, you don't, if you pay 50% of the bond, you don't own 50% of the house. You only own the house when you have the title to the house. So you can pay 80% of the bond and the bank can still take the whole house away from you. The bank doesn't come and say, oh, I'll only take 20% of the house. I'll they'll take the whole house. So, so, um, so no, a house is, the transfer of a house is at a point in time. But for over, um, so, so uh, the, the question is, uh, what is an example for over time? And an and example for over time, we will come to, to, to a couple in today's lecture. But the example for over time can be, for example, like a bridge, right? So a bridge, um, and the contractor for a bridge will get go to the government contract to, to, to build a bridge. But the bridge doesn't get built instantly, right? The other thing is because the bridge is being built on government land, whatever is on the government land, he owns or the government owns. So um, that means that on day one, only a small portion of the bridge has transferred. On day two, another portion of the bridge has transferred and so on and so on and so on. So, so, so with the bridge, it, it, that happens over time because it takes a long time for us to get to, 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 um, to, to the final product. Um, someone's asked about cell phone contracts. So in a cell phone contract, there's two parts. The one is the use of the network and the other is the cell phone, right? The one is the use of the network and the other is the cell phone. So um, when we look at the cell phone, the cell phone trans, the person can control the cell phone um, the day that they walk out of the store. So for the cell phone part, we actually find that there's a, a transfer instantaneously, right? But for the use of the network, that happens over a period of time. So, so cell phone contract is a good one. Anyway, let's now have a look at this idea of control. Right, so I want to try, so now we're trying to define control. So we're starting on the right-hand side of the slide and we say, so control is, we must be able to direct the use of the asset. It means you need to determine how I use the asset, right? So when you go to the computer land, uh, you guys are gonna answer now in the chat, only yes or no, don't write uh, long stories, but uh, answer in the chat, when you go to the computer land on campus, can you control how the computer is used? And your answer is going to be right. So people that are using the computer in the computer land can control the, the computer, right? So that's what everyone has said, right? Now, um, the, the other thing is how, the question is how long can you control it for, right? We can only control it for the time that you're there. So, so that's an important thing that we need to keep in mind. Anyway, the, the next criteria is uh, the person is able to gain benefits from using of this of this um, of this asset. Uh, the person is able to get benefits, meaning now benefits are defined as either an inflow of cash, right, or a reduction of some sort of outflow. So, so it doesn't need to only be money coming in. It can also be a, a reduction of money going out, right? So, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a situation where someone. Uh, gets uh, books right in the next example, and I'll explain why why this is so important. So, so it can either be an inflow of of, of benefit or an outflow, uh, a reduction in the outflow of a loss, right? So, um, what do indirect benefits mean? Indirect benefits mean a reduction in the outflow, right? And direct benefits mean an increase on inflow. So that's what indirect benefits mean. So uh, the question now that I have for you is when you are using the laptop in the LAN, right, in the computer LAN, do you gain any benefit, right? What's, what is your answer there? Do you gain any benefit when you are using the computer in the, in the computer LAN? 
do you gain any benefit? And yes, you do gain a benefit. Uh, what, what sort of benefit do you gain? Well, you gain the benefit of being able to use uh, uh, the, the laptop and, and gain uh, utility or value out of that. But also, you are not having to go and pay to use a laptop in, for example, a uh, uh, internet cafe down the road. So you're saving, there's a, there's a reduction of the outflow. Um, uh, and there's, there can be an inflow of cash because you are actually going to use that laptop to get a degree. And so th that is a, uh, that's an inflow of value. Getting a degree is an inflow of value. Okay. So, so yes. So, yes, you do. You do. Right. The next thing is, um, can you prevent the laptop from being used by other people? Now, people might say, Yes, I can control when I'm sitting at the laptop, no one else can use it, right? Yes, when I'm sitting there, no one else can use it. That is true. When you're sitting there, no one else can use it, but you have to eventually get up. You have to eventually get up and leave that laptop. And when you leave it, someone's going to use it, right? So you can control the use and prevent other people from using it only for a short period of time. So what does that mean that you have? You have a right to use the laptop. You don't have control over it, right? Or I'm saying laptop, but I mean a desktop computer, right? You have a right to use the desktop. You don't have control over it because eventually someone else is going to use it, right? So this, if we look at the last criteria, it is not met. The last criteria, you cannot prevent someone from using it going forward. You can only prevent it for the time that you are there. And because you are human, you cannot be there forever, right? You cannot be there for the rest of the useful life of the laptop or the computer. You have to go somewhere. You have to go to the toilet. You have to eat. You have to drink. So as a result, you cannot control and prevent others from using it, okay? Um, you can't prevent others from using it. Okay, so criteria one is met, criteria two is met, criteria three is not met. So you as a student do not have control over the computer uh, in, the, in, the, in the computer room. You don't have control over it. Okay, so that is our example for that. Now, again, like we said, we can do, we can have uh, satisfaction over, uh, over time and at a point in time. So uh, or when we say at a point in time, we talk about instantaneous right? One day it was there, the next day it wasn't there, or one day it wasn't there, and the next day it's there. And you think of like uh, you buying a cell phone. The one day you walked into MTN, you didn't have a cell phone. When you walked out, you had a cell phone. So it happened instantaneously at a point in time. But with the, with the cell phone contract, you can't say, oh, the one day I was able to uh, not use the network, and then um, I was able to use the network. You, you use the network over time, uh, right? You don't use it. You don't use all the two two years. If you have a two-year contract, you don't use that entire two years uh, in one day instantly. You use it over the two over the period of two years. So that is over time, right? Um, and then again, this test is only done at the beginning, right? So you only do it at the beginning of the contract. You don't. It's not something that you need to reassess, reassess, right? You only do it at the beginning. Now let's look at an example. Okay, so in this example, right, so like I said, these slides are up on, on ClickUp. If you're struggling, please uh, ask a friend. It's definitely there under uh, uh, lecture notes. So, so let's have a look at this example, right? So we've got a book publisher, right? The book publisher um, now goes and has a contract with a bookstore. Now, we are the accountant for the book publisher, right? We are the accountant for the book publisher. Right? So we go and have a, a contract with a bookstore, and we say to the bookstore, I'm going to give you 1,000 books. It's going to cost um, 10,000 currency units. Maybe it's, so, so the, if they, yeah, maybe it's the gripping gap book that they're selling here. Um, and then they say, the contract stipulates right, that you cannot sell the books until the 15th of June. Right? The contract stipulates you cannot sell the books until the 15th of June. That is the only after the 15th of June can you sell the books. That's basically what it's saying. Right? But in order for you to sell the book on the 15th of June, you need to have it before then. That makes sense. right? You can't sell something you don't have. 
So you need to have the books before the 15th of June, right? So they deliver the books to your to, to the bookstore's warehouse, at least. They deliver the, the books to the bookstore's warehouse on the 5th. Okay, so let's go chronologically. Let's look on the 5th of June. So on the 5th of June, let's go back to our criteria, right? Now we want to de de decide if there's control, right? Um, on the 5th of June, right, um, can we direct the use? Well, yes, we sort of can direct the use because we can read it if we want to read it. We can, um, uh, you know, uh, put it away in the cupboard. We can uh, prevent other people from reading it. We can, so we, we can sort of, we can sort of control or direct the use of the books uh, or, or the, sorry, the bookstore can uh, control or direct the use of the book. So we're going to say yes there, right? And in orange, we're going to say yes there. Um, then we want to ask, can we prevent other people from using it? Yes, we can. We can prevent other people from using it because we can lock it up in a cupboard. We can lock it away in the warehouse. It, we can stop people from reading it. So yes, we can. Um, then the second criteria. Can we earn cash flows? You're going you're gonna to pop either yes or no in the chat now. Can we earn cash flows from the book? Right? Can we earn money for, on the 5th of June, right, when it was delivered, can we earn cash flows from the book? Right? And the, re, and the answer is no, we can't earn cash flows. Right, we can't earn cash flows because we can't sell the book yet. We can only sell it on the 15th. So we can't. So we're going to put a little cross here in orange. I don't know if you guys can see that. We're going to put a little cross here in orange. We can't earn cash flows. Right. Then the next question is: Does it reduce some sort of cash outflow? Does it reduce our cash? Is it indirect? And again, the answer is no, because for us to keep the books on our property on our in our warehouse it actually is costing us money to keep it in our warehouse because we need to pay rent for the warehouse for the time that the book is is there in the warehouse so it's actually so again the second one of indirect benefits is also not met right the second uh, require indirect benefits also not met so here we have a situation where two of the criteria were met but one wasn't. And remember, we're working on an and principle here. We're going to get to one where we're not doing and, we're doing or. But now we're doing an and principle. So that means that we don't, or the bookstore doesn't have control on the 5th of June. We, they don't have control on the 5th of June. So we're going to put a cross there. On the 15th of June, that uh, second criteria then becomes met, right? Because we can earn income. Um, uh, will it reduce the cost of storage? It, it, it won't reduce the cost of storage, but uh, as we earn the income, we assume that that inflow will outdo or, or strip out the, the outflow of rental, right? The, because we are a business, right? So we obviously, the aim of a business is to get more revenue than expenses. So, so as a result, we can assume that criteria two are met because we've got this inflow that is going to cover all the costs that relate to, to the good. So we so on the 15th, it is met. So can you see in this situation, guys, that uh, we have a situation where the goods were delivered. The customer was in physical possession of the goods, right? Does that make sense? The customer was in physical possession of the goods, but the control had not passed until the 15th. Does that make sense? The control had not passed until the 15th, which means from the, the perspective of the book publisher, right? the publisher of the book. So remember, we the accounting for the publisher. From the perspective of the publisher of the book, they cannot recognize revenue until such time that the control has passed. So they cannot recognize revenue until the 15th. Anyone have an issue with that? Just put up your hand. Um, or, 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 or type your question in the chat. Okay. Okay. So that is the control, right? Now, sometimes it can be extremely difficult to determine whether control has passed or not. So in the last example, it was sort of easy, but sometimes we can have a situation where it's very difficult uh, and we might not know whether the control is passed over time or at a point in time, right? So the standard helps us by giving us uh, criteria, right, um, 
for over time. And it says if the criteria for over time, for over, uh, satisfied over time is not met, then it must be at a point in time. So, so the way these criteria work is any contract that we have has to go through this criteria. And only if, all, if, only if we answer no to all of these criteria, then we can say it's, it's at a point in time. So, so said differently, right? So we said that, but we want to say differently. If, we, if one of them is met, then it means it's over time. Right? So any one needs to be met. So here it's not and, it's or. So this or that or that any one uh, is met, then we're sitting with a, with a contract that uh, is over time. Okay? Um, does, does, do you understand what that means? Right? So any one needs to be met. Let's quickly, uh, let's quickly read through the, 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 the criteria, but we're going to do each one in detail just now. Right? So the first one says that um, the entity is able to consume the benefits while, so, so the customer at least is able to consume the benefits while the entity is still performing it. Right? So that's the first one. The next one is saying the customer takes control of the asset while the entity is still creating the asset. All right. And then the last one says there's no alternative use for the asset or the entity has a right to force the customer to pay. It. Right. Now we're going to look at each in detail. Let's look at the first one. First one, again, it says the customer, right, is using the benefit or consuming the benefit while the entity is still performing on the obligation, right? So let's give ourselves an example. Let's say you, uh, as a student, you have a room and you get you contract with a cleaner to clean your room, right? And you say to the to the cleaner, I want you to clean for the entire month. I'm going to give you one payment, one salary um, for the entire month, um, and and um, uh, you know, and, and, and that's the contract, right? So, so then the cleaner comes on day one and cleans your room, right? And so my question to you is, has the contract been concluded? Have all the POs in the contract been satisfied? Your answer in the chat now, have all the um, uh, POs, have all the performance obligations being satisfied? Has the contract been concluded? Everyone is answering no, that's right. Right? No. So in that case, you are consuming the benefit, right? The benefit is, is that you have a, a clean room, right? Uh, the benefit is that you don't need to clean it yourself. You have a clean room. You don't need to pay someone else to clean it, right? So, so you have a clean room, right? But the contract is still ongoing. The, 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 the domestic helper is still needing to clean the room tomorrow and the next day because remember you contracted for the whole month. Every day, the cleaner is going to come to clean the room. So after day one, the contract is not over. After day two, the contract is not over. After day three, the contract is not over. So if we have a situation like that, we have to say yes here, right? So it says, is the customer benefiting or consuming the benefit, consuming the, the PO while the entity is still performing the PO? And the answer here would be yes. We are consuming the benefit of having a clean room while the domestic worker is still contracted to, to come and uh, do more of the obligation, to, to perform the obligation again, right? And the key to this is that we generally are dealing with an un, um, uh, unspecialized and uncustomized um, or, or, or a, and said differently, a routine type of work, right? Because in, in, as we, and you'll see just now, as we go to more specialized situations, we find that um, uh, we can't, we're not able to consume the benefits in the same way, right? So, so um, the, the question that the standard is asking us is if the um, entity stopped performing the obligation halfway through the contract, right? And, and a new uh, supplier was employed, 
would that supplier need to redo the work that was already done, right? So substan it says substantially redo or reperform the obligations that were already done. Now let's apply that to our situation with our cleaner, right? So we got the cleaner on day one and we told her, right, okay, you contracted for the whole month, every day you're coming to clean my room, um, and, and the cleaner did day one and maybe even did day two, but then on day three, she got COVID and she couldn't do it. So what she did is she sent her friend to come and clean your room on day three. Does it mean now that when the new cleaner comes, the new cleaner has to redo the work that was done on day one and day two? Does the, does the new cleaner have to go back and re-clean the room on day one and re-clean the room on day two in order for them to do day three? And the answer is no. So, so again, here we would say um, that that th there's no need to redo the work, and because we we're saying uh, there's uh, there's no need to redo the work, then we can say that we do consume the benefit. We are gaining benefit out of this contract as time goes on, right? So, if we answer no to this, we are actually answering yes to the big criteria, right? So no to this one equals a yes to that one. That's what we say. All right. So now I want to change the, our scenario just a little bit. And I want to say, let's say we hired um, a lawyer. And the lawyer was uh, representing us on a case. And so um, the lawyer did a, lo a little bit of work, maybe two or three days of work for us. And then we got angry with the lawyer and we fired him. And we got a new lawyer to come in. Would the new lawyer need to redo the work that the old lawyer did? Your answer in the chat. Would, so let's say the old lawyer read a document uh, to prepare for the case. Would the new lawyer say, oh, you know, the old lawyer read that document. I don't need to read it, right? Because the old lawyer read it, so I just need to continue on from where that person left off. And the answer is uh, the old lawyer needs to read it, right? The old lawyer is forced to read it. So there, in that case, we are dealing with something that is highly specialized. It's, it's non-routine. It's a highly specialized skill. When we compare the cleaner to the lawyer, the cleaner is a routine situation, but the lawyer is a very highly specialized situation, right? You see? So, so then uh, we say that the, the lawyer needs to substantially re-perform, right, the work. They need to redo the work. So... Uh, because they have to redo the work, we're going to answer yes to this question, which means we're answering no to the big criteria. All right? Does that make sense? Any questions about the yes-no situation? Uh, pop it in the chat. Okay? Any questions? Doesn't seem like it. If you do have anything, I will come back. But I'm moving on to the second criteria. Remember, the second criteria is saying that uh, as we are creating the goods and services, the customer is taking control of the goods and services. As we are creating it, the customer is taking control of it, right? And so, um, and sort of the things that we need to consider, and again, we're starting on the right side of the slide here. The things that we need to consider is firstly, do we have a right to payment? Is there something contractually saying that the payment of of this contract needs to happen over time, right? And if in the contract we say that we need to pay a little bit of, of the transaction price, it needs to be paid every day or every month or every uh, 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 little time, a little bit at a time, then that is an indicator that maybe we're dealing with something that is over time, right? And maybe we're dealing with something that, we, uh, that the, the customer is gaining control as it's being made. Right, so that's so that's the first indicator. The next indicator is a legal title. So, is the legal title for this good and service transferring a little bit at a time over a period of time? Um, uh, and so, the thing that we need to remember is that if the um, if the entity is holding back the title of a completed product, right? So, the key is that it's a completed product. If the entity is holding back the title of a completed product in order to force the customer to pay, we need to not consider. We need to not consider that, right? Um, then the third indicator that we need to look at is physical possession, 
right? Physical possession, we need to be very careful because physical possession doesn't necessarily mean that the entity has control. It's just an indicator of control. And, and I think you can sort of see that from the example that we just did with the books where the bookstore had physical possession, but it didn't have control. Right, so that's so that's one risks and rewards. So the one that I always like to say is, if a vase breaks, who's going to pay for it? Right. So if the if the uh, uh, goods or service breaks somehow, who is liable to pay for it? And and when we identify who is the person who's paying for it, then we know that that the rewards have passed. And if we say that only part of it needs to be repaired by the customer and part of it by the entity, then we have a situation where it's over time. And finally, we need to look at the contract to identify how the customer is going to accept the goods, how the customer is going to accept the goods. So this is the last criteria. We're actually looking only uh, from a contractual basis, right? We're looking only in criteria five or indicator five, we're looking only from a contractual basis to see, is there some formal uh, acceptance that happens over a period of time? Right. So those are the things that we look for when we're talking about something that um, someone is gaining control of something as it is being uh, created. Now we're going to do an example of that just now, and you'll see what I'm talking about it. But but let's look at example uh, at criterion three. Um, right. So criterion three was sort of a double barreled criterion. It was saying the first is that there's no alternative use and the next is that we have a right to enforce payment okay so that was criterion three there's no alternative use and there's actually a right to enforce some sort of payment right so if we have a look at at <clears throat> if we have a look at no alternative use the first thing is that uh, the standard tells us that there must be a substantive substantive means we have the right to enforce it through law right there must be a substantive contractual uh, 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 clause that prevents us from using the good as it's being made. Right? There's a substantive uh, contractual clause that prevents us from using the good in some other way as it is being made. So we look at an incomplete asset here, an incomplete good, incomplete service. Is there something that's preventing us contractually from using it elsewhere? Um, so that's the first question that is being asked. Then the next question that they're asking is, so, so we're still looking at whether there's an alternate use, right? Uh, the next question that's being asked is, practically, does it make sense that we can use the completed products elsewhere, right? And if we answer no uh, to this one um, and, and sort of yes to this one, then we're going to have to say there's actually no alternative use, right? So if we say no, there's no contractual uh, thing that says we can't use it, then there's, um, sorry, if we say yes, there is a contractual thing that says we can't use it, then we say there's no alternative use. And if there, if we say we actually can't use it practically elsewhere, then there's no alternative use, right? So that's how those two indicators relate back to the criteria, right? The next sort of thing is the enforceable right to payment. Uh, the first thing is that the standard says this enforceable right must be available throughout the contract. It can't arrive only at the end of the contract. The right to enforce payment must be throughout the from the inception till the end. So it gives us a sense of continuation of the right. And if there's that continual right, then that means that it's being satisfied over time, right? Then it means that 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 the um, that, that the that the satisfaction is happening over a period of time as opposed to at a point in time uh, and then so here in the last criterion you'll remember last uh, lecture you'll remember that we said the standard did not actually uh, determine what a reasonable markup is when it comes to significant compensation the standard goes in detail and the standard says listen it must be the cost plus a significant markup and, and the significant markup is defined as either the markup in the very contract that we're using, so cost plus the markup in the contract that we're using, or it can be in a similar contract that we have concluded in the past. 
right? So, so it, now it helps us and defines what the significant compensation means. So significant compensation is a cost plus a reasonable markup, and the reasonable markup is either the, the same um, markup in this contract or a markup in a similar contract. Okay, so those are the three criterion. I do see that we are running a bit late, but those are the, are the three criterion. Let's just do a quick example, right? So in this example, we've got an audit company. So most of you all will know audit firms, audit companies. Um, so we've got an audit company that is has been contracted to give an audit opinion, right? And, and they call this here a professional opinion, right? So the, they're going to give a professional opinion to uh, a client, uh, but within their contract that they have, they say that if the contract is terminated early, right, then the customer is required to pay the audit firm cost plus 15% uh, on, on whatever the cost is, so cost plus 15% markup. Um, and then it says, in general, 15% um, markup is, is what we earn on similar contracts. Okay, so let's apply the criteria. The first criteria here, the first criteria is it says, uh, does the customer um, gain benefit while the obligation is being satisfied, uh, while the obligation is still being performed? So the question is, does the entity uh, that is being audited, right? So the auditee, uh, do they gain any benefit from the audit opinion while the auditor is still doing the audit? And your answer in the chat? Does the, does the company gain any benefit from the audit opinion while the auditor is still auditing? Right? So think about it. I'm busy auditing the company. How is the client gaining benefit? The client can only gain benefit when I when they have the opinion in their hand and they go and then they can go to the bank and then they can go to investors and say, listen, I've got this audit opinion that says my accounts are correct. Right? So while I'm doing the audit, there's no benefit going to the client. In fact, while the audit is being done, it's actually a cost to the client. The client is paying for me to be there and I'm sitting in their offices, I'm using up their space. I'm, I'm not giving them any benefit. The only benefit they're getting is when I sign that of audit opinion at the end. Does everybody understand what an auditor is and what, what a, I think maybe there's, there's a lack of understanding around what an auditor is and how an audit opinion works, right? So an audit opinion, auditor goes there, he does the auditing, and then he gives this opinion to the client. The client takes that opinion and then goes to investors, goes to the JSC, goes to the banks, and gets uh, money from them. So that's sort of what what it is so while i'm busy compiling that opinion and sometimes it can take up to six months for big companies for an order to to be concluded while i'm busy compiling that opinion um, the client is not benefiting at all right so the first one as first criteria here is not met right it's not met it, it doesn't they don't gain benefit while i'm still doing the work Right? So the next one is, do they gain control of the opinion? Right? Do they, are they able to control the opinion while I'm still doing uh, the audit, while I'm still creating the opinion? And again, they're not able to control that document because I haven't given them that document. I just want to see the chat. There's some, there's some that I missed here. Uh, so someone says, oh, so the benefit is the final opinion. Yes, the benefit can only be gained from the final opinion. Um, the full audit has to be done. Yes, the full audit has to be done in order for me to reach an opinion. I can't reach an opinion on half an audit. In fact, if an auditor does that, they can actually be uh, removed from ERBA if they do that. Um, so yes, the client benefits from the finalization of the audit done by the auditor. Yes, uh, I'm confused about why it says yes there. So, so, so no. The, the first criteria is not met, and the second criteria also is not met. So the second criteria, so both the first, the, we only did two criteria, the first and second are not met. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So anyway, 
um, let's have a look at the last criteria. So the question is, can an auditor use the audit opinion that they were making for one client? Can they use it for another client, right? That's what is being asked. Your answer is going to pop up in the chat now. Can I uh, do work on, uh, so let's say, NetBank and then go to uh, Standard Bank and say, here's the work I did on NetBank? I mean, you, you can't do that. So there's no alternative use, right? There's no alternative use, right? So remember, I need to answer yes to these things in order for, for it to be over time. So, so far, it's not over time. So, so far, I've answered no, right? I've answered no uh, for one. I've answered no for two. I've answered no for, for basically 3A. <laughs> So I've answered no, no, no. So I'm going more towards at a point in time. Now let's have a look at this last requirement. This last requirement says, is there an enforceable right to receive payment, right, for a completed audit? Is there an enforceable right? And if you go to the criteria in number three, right, go to the criteria, it says the enforceable right must be continually available throughout the contract and must be significant compensation. Let's have a look at the question again. So it says, um, if the person terminates the contract, any time during the contract, if it's being terminated, then I have a right to ask for cost plus 15%, right? And the cost plus 15% is what I use on similar sort of contracts. It doesn't say it's what I use on this contract, but it is sort of what I use on similar sort of contracts. So if we have a look again, let's just go back to that slide. If we have a look again, we, we have not met one, criteria one, right? We've not met it, there's the cross. We've not met criteria two, thus the cross. We've not met criteria 3A, but criteria 3B, we have met. Can everyone see that? I see everyone's already answered yes in the chat. So criteria 3A, we have met. And remember how this these criteria work. If you meet one, you only need to meet one. If you meet one, then it's over time, right? And so now we're sitting with a situation where we have a contract that is over a period of time, right? So we need to recognize the revenue. Here it says, yeah, right at the bottom, it says we need to recognize the revenue over a period of time. The reasoning be, uh, for that is that um, we um, have a situation where we have an enforceable right to ask for, for payment. Okay. Um, so on this one, we again, very similar to the one that we did previously. I do realize that we over time, we've only got uh, four more slides left. Um, on this one, we uh, just like the one we had previously, there's someone say, uh, sent software, right? Someone gave software away. Um, Someone gets software away. Someone said, the last criteria says, and, and, yeah. So there's no alternative use. So we can't use the contract, we can't use the opinion on another company. So there is no alternative use. And then we said, um, uh, we do have a right to enforce payment. So then the criteria is met. And because the criteria is met, because you answered yes to the big criteria, we have a thing that is over time, over a period of time. So again, let's look at this example. So we have an example here where we say there's software, right? We've got software that we need to uh, send to the company. And then we've got this maintenance contract, right? So the question is, um, are these two things distinct? And so we do the distinctness test and we decide, no, it's not distinct. We're not going to do it now because that's not what today's lecture is about. You guys can go back to lecture last week, Friday's lecture, and then you can, um, does, so someone's asked, sir, does the business still receive benefit if the audit opinion is one of no opinion? 
So what you are talking about is a disclaimer of opinion. So there's different types of audit opinions. What you're talking about is the disclaimer of opinion where the auditor says, I'm going to withhold my opinion. And out of all the different opinions, that is the most worst case scenario. That is the most dangerous, the danger, most dangerous scenario. So it, it won't only uh, not provide benefit, it will be very dangerous to the client. It's, it's going to hurt the client a lot if I hold, would hold my opinion. I don't know if that answers the question. It's sort of an audit question, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, back to accounting. <laughs> so, so let's assume that we've got distinct obligations, right? And, and we say, so the so software, the rights, does the uh, entity control the software when we deliver the software? So we need to ask ourselves, can the entity control the use of the software? We'll say yes. Can the entity gain benefit from the software? We'll say yes, because the entity can use it in their business to gain benefit. And can they prevent other companies from using the software? And the answer is yes. So the control of the, of the uh, software is actually passed at a point in time. So notice this is not the construction of software. We, we are giving them a licensed software. We're giving them a completed software. Right? You're going to see an example um, uh, 4.17 in your question book, 4.17, where they're constructing the software. So that's very different from giving someone a completed product. Right. So just keep that in mind. So here, because we deliver it at a point in time, it, it actually transfers at a point in time. With the maintenance contract, we say that the person, and if you read carefully, it says that it's a, if, it's a when and if basis. So there's no specific work that needs to be done at a specific time. It's just sort of whenever, whenever we just do it whenever. Um, and so, and so that one is is uh, is satisfied over a point in time. And the reason for that is because there's no discernible way in which the entity is uh, can say that I've satisfied the entire. Uh, contract. The only way you can say that you've satisfied the entire contract is when you get to the end of the third year or the or the end of the third um, term. It says third year term. Yeah. So the end of the third year. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So so now we've gone through and we've decided whether something is satisfied over a period of time or at a point in time. It's easy to account for things that are at a point in time. All we need to do is when control passes, um, we record the revenue, right? So that's easy. At a point in time, easy. Over time or over a period of time is a bit more difficult. The standard um, sort of recommends two methods. The first method is the output method, right? The output method. So is the license and maintenance two POs? Yes, the license and maintenance are two separate POs. Um, the, the licensed software and the maintenance contract are two, PA, two different POs. So anyway, back to our story now. So we said, if we have something that's satisfied over a period of time, right? So we're over time now, we're only dealing with situations where over time. We said, if it's at a point in time, we'd recognize the revenue when control transfers. But now if we're dealing with something over time, the methods that we need to use is either the output method or the input method. Now, the output method is the more superior method, thus the smiley face. Um, and the input method should only be used when the output method is not available. And it might not be available for a cost reason. So it might be too expensive for us to do the research to find out what the outputs are, right? And so in some situations, some complex processes, that is the case. Uh, and the input method uh, and so it's, so it's too expensive, we can't do it, or it's impractical, and we can't use the output method, right? So, so then we'll have to use the input method in that situation, right? Input is the less desirable one. The only rule is that whatever we do, we must be consistent, not only in the same contract, but with the similar obligation. So it actually goes outside of the contract that we are currently looking at. We must be consistent with similar performance obligations, right? So that's a, quite a, a, a stringent uh, requirement placed on us, okay? So let's think about sort of how we do this, right? So this is a bit more detail about how we would do it. 
So if it's over time and we use the, the, the input method, remember the input method with an I, the input method is not the desired one, is the sort of fallback, is the second, is the second one, the second best one. So, so the input method, we look at the entity's efforts and, and they're very cleverly worded that uh, saying the entity's efforts because they wanted to include things like costs incurred as well as labor hours or machine hours or any sort of thing that's, that's, um, that we can say, oh, we did it based on this contract. So the, whatever, we, whatever we efforted can be used um, to determine when we, we record um, when we record the, the revenue. Now, the reason why the input method is less desirable than the output method is because of this idea of work in progress, right? Uh, many of you guys heard about work in progress. So what happens is I can say, oh, I produced 10 products, right? But I only sold eight of those 10 products, right? And I've got a little bit sitting in uh, finished goods, right? So there might be some still in work in progress, some still in finished goods, uh, and, but I only sold eight. So does it make sense for me to say, oh, because I produced 10 products, I'm going to recognize the revenue for all 10? It doesn't make sense because there's still like eight sitting somewhere in my processes, right? Whether it's in finished goods or work in progress, it's somewhere there. And so that's why we don't like to use the input method because it's not as uh, accurate as the output method. The output method would then use exactly what has been outputted from the company. So it would exactly use the eight that has left the entity and all been sold. That would be the output method. And that looks at the value of goods that is transferred to the customer, right? Um, so now let's look at an example. This is the last example and then we're done. So in this example, we've got an entity which is constructing or building residencies for University of Pretoria students, right? So they're making residencies for University of Pretoria students. They operate in Hatfield, right? And they are doing a total of 10 rooms for the University of Pretoria students, right? They're only making 10 rooms. Now it says um, the rooms can only be occupied by the students when it is completed, right? So, that, so they have to complete all of it. Um, and uh, the cost of this, of this specific um, uh, uh, contract is 100,000. And then also we told here that we don't need to do step three because they're telling us that the contract price is equal to the transaction price in this example only, right? Not in the ones that you're gonna get in the test, only in this example. The contract price equal to the transaction price of 100,000 and the expected cost is 75, right? The expected cost is 75. Now it says, in 2019, uh, only three rooms were built. Um, a total of three rooms were built, and and that was at the end of the year. And the costs incurred for those three rooms was 25,000. Okay. Then in 2020, a total of eight rooms were built. Right. So this eight includes those three. Right. So a total of eight rooms were built, and now the costs incurred are 70,000. But as usual with uh, construction companies, they then said, oh, when we started, we underestimated the cost uh, that it will take us. Now the cost is 80,000. So the cost, the estimated total cost has moved from 75 and it now sits in 2020, it now sits at, um, it now sits at 80,000. So let's record this using the input method, right? So if we have a look at the at the input method, um, we say that the costs that were incurred in 2019, let's only look at 2019 for the first time uh, for, for a little while. In 2019, 25,000 was incurred, right? So they gave that to us in the question, right? 25,000 was incurred. The expected cost is, is 75 and the transaction price is going to be 100. So we say 25 over 75, um, uh, that gives us one third, and we say one third of a hundred is thirty three thousand thirty three hundred and thirty rand thirty three rand. So, so that's the amount of revenue that we recognize. We say debit the the debtor. That means because now the debtor owes us, and then we say credit revenue. Okay, great. So that one is easy. Now in the second year, we have 
costs incurred of 70,000, the, to the total expected costs have now gone up to 80,000, which means when we do our calculation, we say 70 over 80, not 75 anymore. That's now changed to 80, right? Um, that gives us a total revenue that we should be recognizing on this contract, right? On this contract, the total revenue that we have earned is 87,500, but we've already recognized 33,000, right? So that means the remaining 54,000 is recognized in, in 2020, right? Again, same transaction, the debtor owes us and we credit um, revenue, okay? Right, so the last slide tells us that we must record, okay, let's go back to the question. The last uh, required, the next required tells us we must use the output method. So let's use the output method in this slide, right? So in this slide, what we do is we say we had a total of 10 rooms, right? We've done three, we've made three of them already. So we've done three out of the 10 rooms, that's 30%. You, you, does everybody understand? And that 30% is now what we're going to record as revenue, right? Can you see that? And again, I'm not going to go through the accounts because it sort of it's easy to we sort of the accounts are the same. So that 30% of the transaction price is what we record there. In year two, we've got eight rooms. We're supposed to have 10 rooms in total. So it's going to be 8 over 10, um, which gives us a total of 80% on this contract. But we've already recognized 30 last year, so we now need to recognize the last 50. Okay. Great. So what you guys are going to do for me, why don't we recognize a refund liability? Excellent question. That is because in this question that we're dealing with, the customer has not paid in advance. So there is no liability that we, we don't owe the customer anything. Remember, the refund liability says we might in the future need to refund the customer some money. And therefore, we recognize a liability for it. That's why it's called a refund liability. We might in the future need to refund the customer. But here, because the customer hasn't paid us yet, we recognize the debtor because the, the customer now owes us. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, great. So what you guys are going to do for me uh, in the next lecture is, again, I want you to print the example, right? Regardless of whether you're online or uh, coming to the face-to-face -to -face lecture tomorrow, please print the example. It's so important. Uh, print the example. You can go through the slides that are on ClickUp because the, the example is in the slides as well. Um, and then I want you to read page 29 to, to 34. Uh, it goes in a lot of detail, but we've mostly covered it because remember that's at the beginning of the chapter. So we've mostly covered uh, that already. Um, in terms of tutorial questions, very important. Remember, guys, I can't tell you what's coming out but I can always tell you what's very important. In today's uh, tutorial questions, you're going to do for me uh, 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 4.17, which is the very important one. And then there's another one that you're doing. I'm just turning to my book. Um, you're also doing 4.16, uh, TerraDrive. So you're doing TerraDrive and tech people. I want you to focus in on tech people. I've got some notes that you need to take down. Uh, for tech people, let me just tell you, I say here, oh, when you're reading the question, right, please keep in mind the difference between the software as a whole, right, please keep in mind the difference between the software as a whole and the modules that make up the software. So the way this question is written, so this is 4.17, the way it's written is they, they talk about different parts of the software. And then they talk about the, the software as a whole. So they, the different parts, they call it the modules. And then the software as a whole, they call the software package. So just keep that in mind, because I got a little bit confused with that one when I was reading it. Um, and then I want you to, before you do, before you attempt 4.17, you have to, have to, have to go over last week Friday's lecture about distinctness, right? You have to do that. Um, 
and and you have to you have to do that in detail. Uh, I said here that uh, sometimes students can be caught in the trap of looking at distinctness and only discussing the first criteria. Um, because we have a situation where we say both criteria must be met, right? We say it, it must be this and that. Students can fall in, into the trap of only discussing one criteria. And if the first criteria is not met, they don't discuss criteria two. That can result in you losing marks. So regardless of the fact whether we're dealing with the or and uh, or and and criteria, you have to discuss all available criteria to capture all available marks, right? So that's important. So just even though it's a you must have both criteria in order for the for the requirement to be met as a as a uh, what uh, the word is um, exam technique for a good exam technique, you need to actually discuss all available criteria so that you capture all available marks, or at least you have access to all available marks. Okay, so that is the important parts that I want to speak to you about. And 